Hello, welcome to Philosophy Roulette 149, where we get philosophy papers and read and review them live on air. So, let's see what's new today. AI in society. They publish a lot. Let's see if this is uh, something we can read. Maybe. Uh, the Carousel of Ethical Machine. Alright, so let's just hold on to that one for a sec. I mean, we've done a lot from AI in society. Well, no, we've done more than one from AI in society. I don't know what counts as a lot at the moment, but... Hmm, antiquity, some just history stuff. Clinical ethics, more bioethics, always with the bioethics. This is sort of the sciencey version of our uh, philosophy and cognition. Mouse tracking study of negative sentence processing, yeah. Like studies. Two year olds consolidate verb meanings during a nap. I think everyone of every age consolidates word meanings during a nap. That's kind of what we, that's what naps are for. How else are we supposed to understand anything? Oh my god. Wow. How much color do we see in a blink of an eye? So. Alright. Let's, in that case, since we've got, been overwhelmed by uh, science today, let's take a look at just the journal list. Hmm. You know, I haven't looked at thought in a while. I always like looking at thought because it's short. Everyone's always welcome to send me stuff to read because why not? I'll read it, review it. Mm hmm. Looks like I've read most of these. Or, I've read all the ones I had access to. <laughs> Rejecting the implicit consensus. I don't think I've read that one, but it sounds interesting. But it's not available, that's why I didn't read it before. Um, that's if the internet also works. Oh dear, lost my uh Is Phil Papers down? No, okay. It's just this not uh thought takes a while to load. Alright. Um Also check the front page of Phil Archive, because that can be helpful too. Yeah, the issue oh that's right. This is um one to twelve is a uh, this is double uh, columned in small font, so that's 24 pages, really, so. Let's see, action and the problem of evil. Ooh, let's see. More bioethics, treating athletes and banned substances. Let's see, what else do we got today? Anything new? Hmm. Philosophy East-West, a response to Chris McDaniel. Ontological pluralism, Abhidharma metaphysics. I haven't done any uh, comparative philosophy in a while. The enhanced indispensability argument and interpretable strategy. Let's also take a look at that. All right, so we've got some uh, options from here. I mean, I do have some saved ones, but these were all, like, they were at the limit of anything I wanted to read, so. so try to get something slightly better, and 15 pages again, ugh. Let's see what this one is. Hmm. It was a docx, so I have to open it up to see what it looks like. It doesn't just pop up in the, uh. doesn't just pop up in the web browser. So let's see. 22 in double space, so that means that's what I'm gonna do. Okay, so. Cool. So today we're gonna read Ontological Pluralism by Andrew Brenner. 
and if you want to get the link in chat, here you go. It's also going to be in the show notes afterwards. The link will pop back up if you type exclamation point paper in the uh, chat box. Oh no, oh, I thought it didn't load for a second. I was like, why? Why are you no load? Chris McDaniel has recently proposed an interpretation of it, the distinction between conventional truth and ultimate truth, as that distinction is made within Abhidharma metaphysics. According to McDaniel's proposal, the distinction between conventional truth and ultimate truth is closely connected with similar distinction between with a similar distinction between conventional existence and ultimate existence. What's more, the distinction between conventional existence and ultimate existence should be interpreted along ontological pluralist lines. The difference between things which ultimately exist and things which merely conventionally exist amounts to a difference in the modes of being enjoyed by the things in question. Okay, so we're going to have like real and then like really, really real. Oh yeah, feel free to tell me uh, any questions or concerns you might have in chat. So I'll try to answer them, but this is my first time reading it too. One noteworthy feature of McDaniel's proposal is the fact that it connects Abhidharma metaphysics with contemporary work within analytic metaphysics, and in particular, contemporary work with work in meta-metaphysics meta, meta and meta-ontology related to ontological pluralism. This is a welcome development. Many of the metaphysical issues addressed by Abhidharma metaphysicians are also addressed by contemporary analytic metaphysicians, and this is true to some extent of work being done in the burgeoning some field of analytic meta-metaphysics and meta-ontology. I have no doubt in work in contemporary metaphysics might help us interpret and evaluate Abhidharma metaphysics and vice versa, but I have some concerns with McDaniel's proposal. I do not have an alternative proposal proposed interpretation of conventional ultimate truth distinction as it occurs within Abhidharma metaphysics, which I would like to defend here. I also have very little to say about McDaniel's objections to the other proposed interpretations of the conventional ultimate truth distinction, which he discusses. I do not criticize McDaniel's proposal on the grounds that it fails to reflect the manner in which the conventional ultimate truth distinction was interpreted by Abhidharmikas. Abhidharmikas, do, and I apologize for my pronunciation of everything. Uh, although, yeah, I apologize for my pronunciation of English too, and for that matter. <laughs> Abhidharmakas do not all speak with one voice on this subject, so it is difficult to make any very confident generalizations regarding how they would have reacted to McDaniel's proposal. My concern is rather that McDaniel's interpretation of the ultimate con conventional truth distinction imposes limitations on Abhidharmakas and their sympath sympathizers, which they should be hesitant to accept. First, for, for first, McDaniel, proposed interpretation of the distinction, if adopted, would be prevent us from employing certain powerful argumenta argumentative strategies which have or could be employed on behalf of certain core Abhid Abhidharma metaphysical theses, in particular the theses that persons are conventionally existent. Second, given McDaniel's proposed interpretation of the conventional ultimate truth distinction, a core Abhidharma metaphysical thesis, namely the theses that persons are merely conventionally exist, turns out to have less important implications than proponents generally think it has. Alright, so I guess this is, um, the argumentative strategy here is saying, look, McDaniel has proposed something that he attributes to, I don't know if, which McDaniel this is, so, uh, McDaniel, they McDaniel, um, uh, they attribute to a certain group, but unfortunately, it has consequences that that group wouldn't want. That doesn't mean McDaniel's wrong, which the uh, author has said, and that doesn't mean that the other people aren't wrong. It's just saying that there's a disconnect here. All right, so let's find out. So here's the plan, blah, 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 blah. Uh, okay, all right, if you're gonna do one of these uh, summary index paragraphs, it's like if you can get it within like this one line, basically, that's okay. Otherwise, I have like, I'm always like, well, this is a philosophy paper. How much do you really need to like, okay, I summarize, concern, and then I summarize. It's like, oh my god. And this is, again, not a criticism of this paper. It's just philosophy writing in general. <sighs> okay. McDaniel on conventional versus ultimate truth. An important feature of Abhidharma metaphysics is its surprising ontological claims. Most notably, Amadharmika's 
contend that it is ultimately true that dharmas exist, but it is not ultimately true that persons exist, although there is some sense in which it is conventionally true that persons exist. What does this distinction between conventional truth and ultimate truth amount to? According to McDaniel, we should interpret the conventional ultimate truth distinction as this, that distinction was employed within Abhidharma metaphysics in such a manner that distinction tracks a similar distinction between conventional existence and ultimate existence. The latter distinct, distinction, in turn, should be interpreted along ontological pluralist lines, according to which the difference between things which ultimately exist and things which merely conventionally exist amounts to a difference in the modes of being enjoyed by the things in question. All right, so like different modes of being. So ultimate existence versus conventional existence is a mode. So what is ontological pluralism? What does it mean to say that some things enjoy different modes of being? One way to get a grip on what the thesis amounts to is by contrasting it with its competitor, according to which there is only one mode of being, that is, monism with respect to being. This sort of monism versus pluralism dispute is similar to other monism versus pluralism disputes within philosophy. For example, the, the dispute between those who think that there's only one way for something to be part of something else, and those who think that there are multiple ways for something to be part of something else. Here the dispute is between those who think there is only one way for things to exist, and those who think there are multiple ways for things to exist. As McDaniel conceives of the ontological pluralism, a fundamental mode of being is had by those things falling within the range. <coughs> excuse me, within the <coughs> wow, within the range of the most fundamental or joint carving quantificational expressions. By contrast, conventionally existent things fall under the range of a joint of a non-joint restriction quantifier, but do not fall under the range of any fundamental quantifier. So a non-joint, uh, that's interesting, non-joint carving unrestricted quantifier. So I guess this goes back to the old Quine thing where it says uh, quantifiers carve the world as its joints. So somehow that's what, what, what it is to be is to be uh, quantify uh, the the subject of a uh, quantifier probably for getting that quote wrong it's very famous but um so we've got a very different understanding of uh, how it is to exist under the uh, how it is to for what it is to be like a quantity or a thing so so there's no fundamental quantifier they just fall under some sort of or conventional unrestricted quantifier, which is a little odd because usually most people in this area don't um, quantify in that way. Okay. Normally we might think of restricted quantifiers as being defined in terms of some restriction being placed on a general unrestricted quantifier. For example, when I say there's no beer, I might be employing a restricted quantifier which is defined in terms of a general unrestricted quantifier so that my statement means in effect that there doesn't exist any beer. If we confine our attention to only those things which exist, unrestricted quantifier in my refrigerator. McDaniel, by contrast, claims that fu fundamental restricted quantifiers are semantically primitive and so not defined in terms of a restricted on a restriction on a more general unrestricted quantifier. Yeah, so it's like the only ones that exist only are local quantifiers. Like, so you're, whenever you quantify, you're only talking about stuff that's like in your room or in the fridge. In the case of beer, but not over the whole universe of discourse, which would be a general unrestricted quantifier. Which is, when I say something doesn't exist, it'd be like unicorns don't exist. But I could say there is no beer. But I, if I say there there is no unicorn, it's a very uh, different meaning because there's also no unicorns in the fridge. But that's not what it means when you say there's no beer in the fridge. The conventionally existent versus ultimately existent distinction interpreted along these lines claims that things which exist ultimately and things which merely exist conventionally both exist conventionally, although things which ultimately also enjoy a fundamental mode of being not enjoyed by, the, by things which merely exist conventionally. So the Abhidharma claim that dharmas exist ultimately while persons exist merely conventionally amounts to the claim that dharmas and persons both exist and they both exist conventionally, but dharmas also enjoy a fundamental mode of being not enjoyed by persons. In fact, McDaniel claims merely conventionally existent objects, such as persons, enjoy a deficient or attenuated mode of being relative to those things which exist ultimately. 
contrast this view with another, to my mind, very natural interpretation of the conventionally existent versus ultimately existent distinction. Those things which ultimately exist really exist, while those things which merely conventionally exist do not really exist, although there is some useful fiction or convention according to which they exist. Just as there is a useful fiction or convention according to which the average dog exists, although there really isn't any such dog out there corresponding to the term the average dog. I don't mean to endure this, endorse this competing conception of the conventionally existent versus ultimately existent distinction, but I cite it here to give help to give a sense of how McDaniel's proposal differs from other natural interpretations of that distinction. Yeah, so we've got this sort of <clears throat> restricted quantifier view versus um, that leads to two... Um, they both exist, but one has a more fundamental uh, thing versus one doesn't... only the fundamental exist and the other ones uh, are just being sort of talked about in a way, in a conventional way or a useful fiction way. So there's still only sort of one kind of like real existence, but then how you deal with the conventional sort of, uh, that's up for discussion, I guess, because they both agree on the uh, ultimate existence. Some of the details of McDaniel's proposal may be hard to follow for those not already steeped in contemporary analytic meta-ontology. Fortunately, as we'll see, my concerns with this proposal do not turn on any particular details regarding the manner of in which McDaniel conceives of ontological pluralism. The important point is to point to note is that for McDaniel, ultimately existent things and merely conventionally existent things all exist, and the main difference between them regards the mode of being they enjoy the or the way they exist. Okay. Any questions? Let me know. How is the distinction between conventional existence and ultimate existence connected with the distinction between conventional truth and ultimate truth? Here, McDaniel remains somewhat non-committal. For example, according to one proposal, conventional truths or falsehoods, or falsehoods are those truths or falsehoods which contain expressions denoting conventionally existent ob existing objects or predicates which are possibly true of conventionally existing objects. Ultimate truths or falsehoods, by contrast, contain no expressions referring to merely conventionally existing objects or predicates which are possibly or true or merely conventionally existing of possibly true of merely conventionally existing objects. Oh, okay, so we've got ultimate truth and then conventional truth, and how do you, how does that match up? So if we've got like the conventional objects, and then we've got the truth here. Then how does this all get together? Because uh, usually when you say something's true, you're saying, well, then that is how the world is. So you've got conventional truth would have to all match up with a uh, conventional uh, existent things, and absolute truth would have to match up with all. Uh, absolutely existing things, but that's not, not, I mean, clearly you could have like some absolute truths that refer to uh, conventional truths or maybe some conventional truths that refer to absolute truths, and how do you slice that? All right. While McDaniel does not unambiguously endorse any particular conception of the manner in which the conventional ultimate truth distinction lines up with the conventional ultimate existence distinction, we have enough to go on to see what I think is problematic about McDaniel's proposal. McDaniel's proposed reading of the conventionally existent versus ultimately existent distinction along ontological pluralist lines is the most important and novel part of his proposal, proposed interpretation of the conventional ultimate truth distinction. It is this part of his proposal which I think is problematic. That is, which I think is the most problematic about McDaniel's proposal is that it claims that Abidamica's distinction between things which ultimately exist and things which merely conventionally exist should be interpreted along ontological pluralist lines. <coughs> According to which ultimately really existent, it really existence and merely conventionally real existence exist, albeit with more and less fundamental modes of being. I'll now move on to a discussion of some concerns I have with McDaniel's interpretation of the conventional ultimate truth distinction. Again, my concerns focus on McDaniel's contention that the distinction between conventional and ultimate existence should be interpreted along ontological pluralist lines and of the sort discussed above. Before I present my concerns, I would like to pause to note the, note the standards by which I plan to judge McDaniel's interpretation. Standards, interesting. Okay, I wonder why that's important here. I do not think we should be very concerned by the question of whether Abidharmicas actually endorsed McDaniel's interpretation of the conventional ultimate truth distinction. For starters, of course, Abitomicus did not explicitly develop that distinction along ontological pluralist lines. What's more, the Abitomica literature is both large and variegated, 
and the Abitamarkas do not all speak with one voice. McDaniel himself recognizes these points. I take it that McDaniel is primarily concerned to present a rational reconstruction of how Abitamarkas should interpret the conventional ultimate truth distinction, given their other philosophical commitments. So the question which concerns me is not whether Abitamarkas would or would not would, would, did or would endorse McDaniel's interpretation of the conventional ultimate truth distinction. Rather, what interests me is whether or not Abitamarkas or philosophers sympathetic with certain core Abitarma metaphysical commitments should endorse McDaniel's interpretation of the distinction. In what follows, I describe some of the limitations imposed on Abitamarkas and their sympathizers who adopt McDaniel's interpretation of the conventional ultimate truth distinction. There are two main limitations I would like to highlight. First, if we accept McDaniel's interpretation of the distinction, we will no longer be able to endorse certain important arguments for distinctively Buddhist metaphysical theses. Here I focus on particular arguments for the Buddhist theses that persons are merely conventionally existent. Second, if we accept McDaniel's interpretation, then certain core Buddhist metaphysical theses turn out to have less important implications than their proponents generally think they have. Here again, I focus in particular on Buddhist theses that persons are merely conventionally existent. Okay. So, two concerns. I've said that McDaniel's interpretation of the conventional ultimate truth distinction imposes limitations on Abitamarkas and their sympathizers, limitations which they should be hesitant to accept. The limitations I have in mind relate to certain core metaphysical theses commonly endorsed by Abitamarkas. One such core metaphysical thesis is the thesis that persons are merely conventional existent. That is, the thesis that pre persons do not ultimately exist, although they do conventionally exist. According to McDaniel's proposal, we should interpret these, this thesis along ontological pluralist lines. So the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent becomes the thesis that persons exist, although they enjoy a less fundamental mode of being than their most basic or fundamental constituents. Uh, skentas, which are a subset of total set of dharmas. No idea what, if I said that right. The first limitation imposed by McDaniel's interpretation of the conventional ultimate truth distinction regards the arguments we would have, would have, we would have at our disposal in favor of the theses that persons are merely conventionally existent. Otherwise, powerful arguments which might be offered on behalf of this thesis would no longer be available to us if we endorse McDaniel's interpretation of the thesis. I will, I'll give three examples. Start with Vasubandhu's refutation of the self. Vasubandhu claims that we can know that there is no self because we cannot there is no self because we cannot establish the existence of the self by either inference or by perception. We might wonder whether Vasubandhu's argument could be extended to show that persons rather than selves are merely conventionally existent. But if the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent is interpreted as a claim that persons do not exist, albeit with a they do exist, albeit with a less fundamental mode of being than those things which fundamentally exist, then we cannot employ Vasubandhu's argumentative strategy on behalf of the theses that persons are merely conventionally existent. We can see why we might be led to believe that something does not exist if we can neither infer that it, that, that thing exists nor perceive that that thing exists. But it, it's completely unjustified to conclude that something exists with a non-fundamental mode of being from the fact that we can neither infer that the thing exists nor perceive that the thing exists. Okay, so I guess this is a well-liked uh, refutation of the self, and then therefore if you can't use that, then um, in terms of McDaniel's scheme, then there's something uh, very odd about McDaniel's scheme because it's incompatible with like a classic argument or a well-liked argument. Uh, it's an interesting argument then. It's like, well, you can't talk, you know, there's always being right for the wrong reasons. And it's like, well, look, we, a lot of times people in the past, they were right about something, but they didn't have all the details. So it's like, well, so what if their argument was not exactly right? It was, you know, it's like, it's like, you've, it, it's like multiple argument realizability. You can get to this, the right conclusion in multiple ways. So, I mean, this is a, a good point that the author brings up, but it's like the author's uh, philosophical argumentative uh, theory here is like, 
they have to build what what they're doing is they're building up multiple of these sort of problematic things to show that the, that uh, McDaniel has a problem. But in any given one, of course, but that's why they have multiple ones. It's like well, multiple realizability and argumentation in some sense uh, still exists, and so it's like yeah, well, you could be right for the wrong reasons, and it might not even be that important. But it's just something interesting about the argumentative the argumentative strategy here is the uh, multiple realizability of argumentation which is not something often discussed. It's like everyone thinks there's like a fundamental reason. Well, maybe their reasons are also, the reasoning is just conventional too, <laughs> in the spirit of the paper. As a second example, it is also hard to re reconcile McDaniel's interpretation of the conventional ultimate truth distinction with a classic argument for the non-self thesis attributed to the Buddha in the Pali Canon, adapted to become an argument for the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent. The argument I have in mind is included in the Buddha's discussion of the, some words I don't know. In the Sutta, the Buddha examines each of the five aggregates and contends that none of them should be identified with the self. Again, we might wonder whether this argument could be adapted into an argument for the closely related thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent. But if the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent is interpreted... Oh, hey, what's up, Positive Blue? It's going pretty well reading something on uh, existence in meta-ontology, basically, how do people exist, and is it conventional, or do we exist ultimately, and this is sort of a Buddhist interpret, a modern take on Buddhist uh, metaphysics. Oh, well, yeah, cool, nice hat. <laughs> yeah, let me know if you have any questions about what's going on. Uh... And the Buddha's arguments in this sutta do not seem if they could help support that thesis. The fact, if it is a fact, that I am not identical with this aggregate, and that I am not identical with that aggregate, and so on, might eventually lead me to think that I do not exist. If we rule out each of the candidate things which, with which I might be identical, but to say that I am not identical with this aggregate, or that one, and so on, would have no tendency to lead me to think that I employ a non-fundamental mode of being. So if we accept McDaniel's interpretation of the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent, then it isn't clear how we could employ this classic argument on behalf of the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent. All right, so I think what's going on here is this is actually attacking McDaniel's uh, understanding of McDaniel's use of the restricted quantifier. So in some sense, if you're going to restrict the quantifier and say, well, things exist in a restricted way, that's fundamentally. Um, so... Is it by how are we restricting the quantifier? It can't be in by inference or by perception, like things that we perceive or, or things that we're quantifying over or things that we infer are things we are like understanding to exist in some uh, mode of existence. And then we're coming um, yes to both of those, uh, positive blue. Um, and then this comes down to a, and then the second example is this classic example is that you've got a, the Buddha comes in and I guess does a sort of, um, what is this? Is this a muriological argument that you can't split things up in different ways? So this is a restriction in terms of muriology and how you break things up into parts. And so you can't restrict things in that way uh, as sort of a muriologically restricted quantifier. So this is sort of going and showing that the different ways you might consider restricting the quantifier, it, they don't work. Now the question is, maybe just the restricted quantifier could say, well, there's a generalization of restriction, and that would be an out for McDaniel, but it'd be sort of a very weak out because it seemed kind of ad hoc. But again, I'm not speaking for uh, McDaniel, and uh, yeah, so let's see what this author has to, what's the final uh, example here. Finally, one natural sort of argument we might give on behalf of the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent is based on Occam's razor, that is, based on the rel relative simplicity of the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent. An argument of this sort would look like this. It is simpler to suppose that there are no persons, and since all other things being equal, simpler theories look simpler theories are more likely to be true, and we have no good grounds for believing in persons which might be override our presumption in favor of the simpler theses that persons do not exist. Uh, how, I'm like right here. I'm sort of more in on this like there. Uh, here's a person right here. I'm pointing to one. So I think we have good grounds for believing persons. Um, but anyway, 
and we have no good grounds for believing in persons which might override our presumption in favor of the simpler thesis that persons do not exist. The relative simplicity of the theses that persons do not exist gives us some reason to accept that thesis. But this sort of argument is not available to us if we accept McDaniel's interpretation of the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent. Hey, maybe you have, I don't know. I mean, it's cool, Blue. <laughs> well, here's one of the issues with this program. I'm, I'm reading academic philosophy, which is generally directed at the academic audience. And so it's very hard for non-academic philosophers to uh, jump into like actual research. It's like reading a paper in modern, uh, modern physics, for that matter, modern chemistry. Uh, it's just, there's a lot that people don't know. So I'm trying to discuss it in a way that makes it a little bit more public. That is kind of part of the uh, project here. So making it more accessible in a, there is some sort of like, what is the public? So try to just like, if you can follow along, cool. If you can't, uh, I'm sorry that it's going to happen. There's things I don't know too. So it gets over my head. And then, uh, but well, I guess the point is to just give it a shot, work through it and see if you can figure something out. So yeah, let's see. So, but this sort of argument is not available to us if we accept McDaniel's interpretation of the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent. On that interpretation of the latter thesis, persons exist. And although fundamental mode of being the thesis that persons do not exist, all other things being equal, simpler than that thesis that persons do exist, and so simplicity considerations might lead us to endorse the view that persons do not exist. You know, I don't buy this one because, like I said, I'm Morian, um, which is, again, if you're in this tradition, then the, the point of the argument here is that if you're in tr the tradition, you like the sim this, so this sort of argument is simpler to you. I'm not in this tradition. I'm Morian in terms of uh, <clears throat> more Morian facts, like here's a hand, hands exist, therefore hands exist, like existent things. And if you want to call that conventional or absolute, that's a different problem. That's like less, that's uh, like secondary to me. So I don't find the, which would make it more complicated. So the simple fact that people exist, like here's a hand, I'm a person, like hands are parts of people, therefore here's a hand, people exist. Like that's the simplest argument I can make, basically, that is the simplest argument. So I'm not buying this argument here, but again, this is not directed at me. This is directed at people who think already that there are no people, or that it's, um, it's a simple argument that there are no people. And so accepting McDaniel's thesis that there are people that conventionally exist is more complicated. So again, this is a another way to uh, attack the hit McDaniel's use of the uh, restriction on the way we're looking at people in terms of simplicity. Is well, they exist, but in a conventional way. Well, why are you calling? Why do you even say that they exist to begin with? Is uh, the argument here, um, even in a conventional way? And because if it's simpler just to say no, they don't exist, like everything else doesn't exist. So. <coughs> All right, so those are the uh, different ways in which we, a uh, person in this tradition might disagree with McDaniel's uh, take on the matter. All right, that's my first concern with McDaniel's proposed interpretation of the conventional ultimate truth distinction. On to my second concern. This, the concern is that given McDaniel's interpretation of the thesis that persons are merely conventional existent, that thesis has less important philosophical implications than its propon proponents generally think it has. One distinctive Abhidharma metaphysical thesis is, as we've seen, the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent. Within Abhidharma metaphysics and within the Buddhist philosophical tradition more generally, the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent is supposed to tell us something important about ourselves. The problem is that on McDaniel's interpretation of this thesis, according to which we exist but enjoy a non-fundamental mode of being, this thesis seems to tell us nothing very interesting about ourselves. For example, two of the central questions regarding personal identity which interest philosophers are one, what are our persistence conditions, diachronic personal identity, What are and two, what are, what are we, personal ontology. But the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent, interpreted as McDaniel interprets it, <laughs> just because I interpret according to Daniel, you don't need that right there. It tells us nothing about our persistence conditions and nothing about personal ontology. Yeah, because it's just a general, like, conventional. It has nothing to do with anything. All right. 
It is, for example, entirely compatible with our being simple immaterial souls and with our being composite organisms. By contrast, coming to learn that we do not exist would provide surprising answers to both of these central questions regarding personal identity. It would show that, strictly speaking, we have no persistence conditions, and it would show that, strictly speaking, we are not anything. For example, we are not immaterial souls. Sec similarly, on McDaniel's interpretation of the thesis that persons are merely conventional existent, that thesis would seem to tell us nothing about what, we, what value we should assign to our projects or interests. By contrast, coming to learn that we do not exist would show that our that those that those of our projects or interests which aim to promote our self-interest are defective, insofar as they rely on the false presupposition that there exist people who might have or fail to have their own projects promoted or interests satisfied. Okay, so this is attacking McDaniel on the abstraction. Instead of on the way McDaniel is looking at things like just like particular items in the world as restricted sort of like well here's a person here's a tree and this is just sort of like I perceive it and that's how it exists as like that mode and it's not it's just a conventional mode this is looking at it in the idea of it even being a quantifier as just like some sort of abstract uh, perspective of uh, existence is being thrust on the world and therefore it doesn't tell us anything interesting um, it's supposed to be a substantive uh, theory when you say you don't exist. Like, you're supposed to, okay, if I don't exist, therefore my uh, projects that promote my understanding of my existence are defective in some way. But if it's too abstract, you no longer get any interesting consequences out of the uh, conventional mode of existence, according to Dan McDaniel. Okay. What all of this tends to show is that the theses that persons are merely conventionally existent, interpreted as a theses that we do not exist, is an interesting and substantive philosophical thesis, one with profound implications for how we should conceive ourselves and our place in the world. By contrast, the theses that persons are merely conventionally existent, interpreted merely as a theses that we enjoy a non-fundamental mode of being, seems to lack any of these interesting implications. It is hard to see why we should care whether we enjoy a non-fundamental mode of being. None of this shows that the theses that persons are merely conventionally existent, interpreted in this way, is true or false. Uh, but what it shows is that, insofar as proponents for that matter of the theses that persons are merely conventionally existent, take this that thesis to have important implications, they should reject McDaniel's interpretation of that thesis. Okay, I know some of the logicians, they take their logic super seriously. They really, really believe it. So they think it would have imp important in interpretations, actually. Um, they really believe in their logic a lot of times. So if someone is coming at this from the logical side, and this is coming from, like, the argument here is coming um, from the uh, side of the tradition, and McDaniel, I think, is coming from, like, the analytic metaphysics side. But I think the uh, other side doesn't appreciate how important the logic might be to McDaniel, and so the idea that this is not a... a uh, this doesn't have important implications might not actually... Uh, be an accurate representation of McDan how McDaniel feels about it. Now, the fact that McDaniel didn't make it clear that this is like super important in some way might, uh, that might matter. But, um, sure. But like the, log the logicians tend to like really think like, no, no, no. Like this sort of like, this sort of using different quantifiers of like the whole world. And so, Granted, the people in the tradition might not appreciate that, but it that, that doesn't necessarily mean McDaniel was being a, a little uh, sort of uh, not substantive here. This is sub this might be substantive, substantive, but in a different way. Like it means something to McDaniel. At the very least, if McDaniel's interpretation of the theses that persons are merely conventional existent does have an, any interesting implications for how we should think about personal identity, the values of our goals and projects, or anything else that we might care about. It would be helpful if he made those implications explicit so that we can see the, why the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent as he interprets a thesis is a thesis we should care about. Okay, that's a, yeah, I completely agree with what the author says here. Interesting. Elsewhere, McDaniel suggests that coming to learn that a person enjoys a non-fundamental mode of being would have a major impact on how we conceive our, of our own value and importance. For first, Things which enjoy non-fundamental modes of being are less worthy of attention than things which enjoy fundamental modes of being. 
Second, things which enjoy a fundamental mode of being have a sort of value, a certain kind of metaphysical goodness, which is lacked by things which enjoy a non-fundamental mode of being. But it isn't clear to me why McDaniel thinks that things which enjoy non-fundamental modes of being are thereby less worthy of attention. By contrast, if something, for example, a person does not exist, th that might naturally lead us to think that the thing is less <clears throat> that less worthy of attention. Why direct our attention to something which does not exist if we can instead direct our <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> instead direct our attention to something which does exist? Similarly, it isn't clear to me why McDaniel thinks that something which enjoys a non-fundamental mode of being thereby lacks some sort of metaphysical value. By contrast, something which does not exist lacks any sort of value since it lacks properties altogether. We might nevertheless find that it is valuable to employ a fiction or convention according to which something which does not exist, for example, a person, does exist. So McDaniel's proposed reason why accepting the thesis that persons are merely conventional existent might have a major impact on how we think of our own value and importance is better captured by an interpretation of the theses that persons are merely conventional existent, which McDaniel rejects, namely an interpretation according to which persons do not exist, even if there is some sense in which there is a useful fiction or convention according to which they do exist. You know, this is a, I think McDaniels could just, might have to just build more into uh, the story about what is a non-fundamental conventional mode of existence. It, it would just have to sort of, re you could probably, maybe it'd be ad hoc, but recapture some of the non-existent, uh, the sort of like why we think that non-existence is less important than existence. So you could build that in, I think. I mean, this is a good point here, but it's not decisive. It's just, again, the, the author strategy here is building up little points of contention along the way, and then eventually, when they get to the end, it'll be sort of like, look, all these contention things, so it makes the whole thing very contentious. This is like death by a thousand little cuts. It's not like a giant, like, blowing up uh, McDaniel's argument, but it's like, cut here, cut here, cut here, cut here. So that's what's going on. I've suggested that the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent, as McDaniel interprets that thesis, would not have certain important implications which the thesis that we do not exist would have. I would like now to make a similar point regarding certain spe specific sodi don't know this word, soteriological and ethical implications which the Buddhist philosophical tradition has sometimes attached to the non-self thesis, as well as the closely related theses that persons are merely conventionally existent. It is important to remember that within Abhidharma metaphysics, the Buddhist philosophy more generally, the conventional ultimate truth distinction is situated within a broader B Buddhist sort soteriological and ethical project. Notably, one of McDaniel's objections to Mark uh, Sideritz's competing accounts of the conventional ultimate truth distinction is that, given Sideritz's interpretation of that distinction, we cannot derive surprising normative conclusions from metaphysics. I think that McDaniel's interpretation of the conventional ultimate Truth distinction faces a similar difficulty, since, as I'll now argue, on McDaniel's interpretation of the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent, that thesis doesn't seem to have the same, doesn't have some of the important soteriological and ethical consequences the Buddhists might expect it to have. Vasubandhu contends that our rejecting belief in the self is crucial for our being liberated from suffering, in part because that suffering is a result of self grasping. Similar sentiments are expressed by other Buddhist philosophers, and in discourse of the Buddha contained in the Pali Canon, it is natural to suppose that if these sort of illogical consequences follow from our rejecting belief in the self, something similar would follow from our rejecting belief in the existence of persons. But it is difficult to see how any interesting sort of illogical consequences of a thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent follows from that thesis, as McDaniel interprets that thesis, that is, interpreted as the thesis that persons enjoy persons exist but enjoy non-fundamental mode of being. Why shouldn't we engage in self-grasping if persons exist, albeit with non-fundamental mode of being? Why should that? Why should the mere fact that persons enjoy a less fundamental mode of being than Dharma have any tendency at all to reduce our suffering? By contrast, as I've suggested above, if we came to believe that persons do not exist, this would have a profound effect on our goals and our aspirations. It would show that those of our projects or interests which aim to promote our own self-interest interest are defective insofar as they rely on the pro false presupposition that there, that there exist people who might have or fail to have their own projects promoted 
or interest satisfied. This seems to be a natural way to interpret the idea that acceptance of the non-self thesis or the thesis that persons are merely conventionally existent would lead to self less self-grasping on our part. Insofar as much of our suffering results from our self-interested goals and projects being thwarted, such, self, such suffering would be reduced if we no longer valued such goals and projects. Yeah, alright, so again, this is hitting McDaniel on the, well, what is the significance of the distinction you're making on the mode of existence? And again, maybe McDaniel has something to say on this. No idea if there isn't something to say, but I suspect McDaniel could come up with something. But this is also one of these like, how big of a project is McDaniel coming up with? Like, does it have to actually satisfy all the uh, like goals? And, well, th that's unfair. I was gonna say, does it have to actually like replicate the entire Buddhist canon? But th th this isn't uh, accusing. No one expects McDaniel to do such things. This is just hitting some of the big points. And uh, so that would be a reasonable uh, thing for Buddh uh, McDaniel to do. Say, look, here's how to hit all the big major Buddhist um, things that they want. And this article is saying, well, it can't even do that. All right. These points are related to a purported ethical consequence of the thesis that persons do not exist. While Santideva was not an avid dharmaka, he presents an influential argument to the effect that the thesis that persons do not exist should lead us to reduce the suffering of others to the same extent as we aim to reduce our own suffering. The basic idea is this, my suffering is bad and should be reduced, but if I should reduce my own suffering, then I should be equally concerned to reduce suffering of others as well. We might respond that my suffering is, well, my suffering, and we each have a special obligation to reduce our own suffering. But this thesis that, my, that persons do not exist undermines this response, since it shows us that, strictly speaking, none of us exist, and so, strictly, strictly speaking, none of us owns any suffering for which we might have special responsibilities. Here is how Santideva makes the point. The continuum of consciousness, like a queue, and the combination of constituents, like an army, are not real. The person who experiences suffering does not exist. To whom will that suffering belong? Without exception, no suffering belongs to anyone. They must be warded off simply because they are suffering. Why is any limitation put on this? If one asks why suffering should be prevented, no one disputes that. If it must be prevented, then all of it must be. If not, then, th then this goes for oneself as for everyone. The conclusion of Santi Deva's argument that we should care about the suffering of others to the extent that we care about our own suffering is endorsed by many other Buddhist thinkers. It is also in keeping with, the, with ethical teachings attributed to Buddha in the Pali Canon, which would have been endorsed by Abhidharmikas. It strikes me as a plausible normative consequence of the thesis that per persons do not exist or of the thesis that persons merely conventionally exist. But I do not see why an interesting ethical conclusion should follow from the thesis that persons merely conventionally exist, as McDaniel interprets that thesis. Take Santideva's argument that, as a case in point, Sant I apologize for saying however you're supposed to say Santideva. Santideva's argument crucially relies on the claim that we do not exist, not merely on the claim that we exist with a non-fundamental mode of being. If we exist with a non-fundamental mode of being, then we are free to contend that we should care more about our own suffering because it is our suffering and we have a special obligation to remove our own suffering. Santi David's response to this idea that we do not have a special obligation to remove our own suffering because we do not exist is not available to someone who endorses McDaniel's interpretation of the thesis that persons merely conventionally exist. An anonymous referee suggested the following response on McDaniel's behalf. Normative facts are only grounded in facts regarding fundamental existent entities, for example, fundamentally existent persons. If that's right, we should be able to endorse Santi Davis after all. In response to someone who claims that I have special obligation to remove my own suffering, we can respond that normative facts of this sort cannot be grounded in facts regarding merely conventional existent persons. In other words, the fact that I have a special obligation to remove my own suffering could not be grounded in the sort of facts appealed to by the opponent of Santi Davis' argu argument, namely this fact are regarding a merely conventional existent person that this is my suffer that this suffering is my suffering here is my reply it seems implausible to me that normative facts must be grounded in facts regarding fundamentally existent entities and more to the point if McDaniel were to endorse the idea that normative facts must be grounded in facts regarding fundamentally existent entities 
or that normative facts cannot be grounded in facts regarding merely conventionally existent entities, he would still be blocked from endorsing Santi Deva's argument. Consider a scenario in which I am suffering and I am merely conventionally existent person, or I am merely conventionally existent in the sense endorsed by McDaniel. That is, I exist, although I enjoy non-fundamental mode of being. The fact that I am suffering seems as if it should ground a normative fact, namely that I have a prima facie motivation to act to remove my suffering. But if normative facts are only grounded in facts regarding fundamentally existent entities, then the fact that a non-fundamentally existent entity suffers cannot ground normative facts, such as the normative fact that I have a prima facie obligation to end my suffering. So it seems like McDaniel still can't endorse an argument of the sort presented by Santi Deva. McDaniel would be blocked at the first step of the argument, since he would have to say that my suffering cannot be ground at cannot be gra cannot ground a prima facie obligation on my part to remove my own suffering. Yeah, and I agree with the author here. I mean, it was a good objection raised by the uh, referee, but there's like a you can you can uh, turn it on its own head and uh, attack the uh, argument there with the same thing. The normativity fails on the same count. <coughs> no. Good defense, author. Conclusion. To recap, McDaniel thinks that the conventional ultimate truth distinction with the Abhidharma metaphysics is closely related to a similar distinction between conventional existence and ultimate existence. What's more, he thinks that we should interpret the latter distinction along ontological pluralist lines, according to which the difference between things which ultimately exist and things which merely conventionally exist amounts to a difference in the modes of being enjoyed by things in question. I have two concerns with McDaniel's proposal. The first concern is that some powerful arguments which might be be employed by Abhidharmakas and their sympathizers for certain distinctively Buddhist metaphysical theses, for example, the theses that persons are merely conventionally existent, don't seem to be available to us if we endorse McDaniel's interpretation of those metaphysical theses. Second, given McDaniel's proposed interpretation of the conventional ultimate truth distinction, the theses that persons are merely conventionally existent turns out to be less philosophically significant than his proponents have generally taken it to be. Of particular importance is the apparent fact that the theses that persons are merely conventionally existent on Mike Daniel's interpretation does not seem to have the important sociological and ethical implications Buddhist philosophers generally expect it to have. Okay, very nice paper. Um, this, uh, like I said, this argument strategy was death by a thousand cuts or death by a few. Make it wasn't a like it wasn't a just like a knockout blow argument. Sometimes you get those where it's like, well, this one fails for like these three reasons. This one is like, look at this example, look at these examples, look at these reasons. And it's like every little one is pretty significant, is not significant on its own, and there might be defenses, but altogether it sort of hits all the major, a lot of the major points that the people in this community, I guess the Amidarmikas, um, would think are really important. And so, therefore, by knocking out all the different sort of, like, major classes of uh, area, it shows that uh, McDaniel has not actually shown that the interpretation given, uh, McDaniel's interpretation, actually um, would uh, s suffice for the, that uh, community. All right. So, so, let's see. Anything specific to say? Um... Oh, I had something else to say. Shucks, now I can't remember. Any, if there's any questions from the uh, peanut gallery out there, please let me know. <coughs> uh, don't remember. Okay, if I can't remember, that's too bad. I'll try to remember. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Uh, Chris McDaniel, yes. Yeah, so this is a problem between uh, understanding how yeah, the modes of existence is very hard to deal with. All right, so have a good day, everybody, and stay safe out there, and I'll be back, I guess, tonight with another paper. Have a good day, folks. Bye-bye.